be or I'm going to talk about uh, my experience with the MV Augusta uh, F3 800. Now, um, this is a brilliant bike it, by every stretch of the imagination. Uh, but first, I'd just like to say um, this particular video is sponsored by, um, I just want to uh, thank some of the I would acknowledge them as sponsors because they were gracious enough to give me the keys to the bike, which allows me to create this content and bring it to you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Keith Baker at Rockwell Cycles. I'd like to thank uh, Nick Rockwell, owner of Rockwell Cycles, for um, allowing me, giving me the privilege of riding uh, this bike. And certainly if you do get to ride this bike, uh, it, it, it is a privilege. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. And it is, um, as I stated in uh, my video and in some of my uh, blogs, that uh, it is a, an experience I will not soon forget. So having said that, um, I'd also, oh, God, I'd also like to uh, thank, um, um, I also like to thank Keith because I also got to test drive a, a, a zero electric motorcycle and I'll get into that uh, a little bit later uh, or in another a live cast and certainly on another video. Um, I've not, I've, my video uploads have been sort of sporadic at the moment and that's because there's just a lot of other things going on. So uh, the, the intermittency of getting my content up in some kind of regular fashion has been left wanting, uh, so to speak. So I'll do my best to get through this because uh, this particular bike is not on a lot of people. Well, it's if you're really into motorcycles, it's def, it's most certainly on your radar. Uh, if you're sort of into motorcycles, you've probably may or may not have heard of um, MV Agusta or the F3, 675, and the 800. Um, it, the thing about MV Agusta, what many people don't realize is, and this is kind of, it's, it's such an understated, uh, the company has really been making concerted efforts to, to get back on point. And with that, with, that, with, the, with the risk of being redundant to some respect, because uh, I covered this bike at some length in detail and sort of a comparison with the uh, Triumph Daytona 675. And there was a rather lengthy discussion with a friend of mine from the UK who uh, not only rides motorcycles, he's actually been racing uh, motorcycles this year, and he also uh, builds motorcycles as well. Uh, so he is a wellspring of knowledge when it comes to knowing or being in the know about uh, certain bikes. Um, and he certainly knows infinitely more about some bikes than I do. Uh, and I kind of wish he were here because he actually owned, or, or I believe he owned um, the Ago, this model here, the F3800 Ago, which is a limited production uh, MV Agusta F3. Um, it has been, um, the only thing that's really, particularly special about this model is one its color scheme which is obvious it has the sort of the flat uh gold finish on the trellis frame the tubular trellis frame and on the wheels and then it has of course the colors of the italian flag uh, being red white and green uh the other thing that makes this particular model special is that there are 300 of them that have been signed or signatured by Giacomo Agostini uh, himself. The living, he is a living legend um, by, by all rights. And one of M. V. Agusta's claim to fame is A, they're the only, well, no other manufacturer has more MotoGP world titles than M. V. Agusta. They have 37, if I'm not mistaken which is why uh, if you happen to throw a leg over this bike, you'll notice on top of the tank, there is the number 37 
uh, right in front of the gas cap on, on this particular machine. Um, I believe that sig insignia is also on the F4, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but I think it's on the F3 and the F4. And if it's not on the F4, then I stand to be corrected, but it most certainly is or does appear on the F3. Now, um, the really, I don't even know, well, it's hard to even know where to start uh, with this machine. Um, the, there was a lot of research. They spent quite a lot of time doing R&D before this bike actually made it uh, to the public. Um, so a lot of research and development went into this bike. Now, I mean, as much as I love glossing over this bike and just, you know, drooling every time I see it, and um, it's certainly much more to see it in person than it is to look at pictures, but although the, it's hard for this bike to take a bad photograph, and uh, I mean, from every angle, I mean, when you look at some motorcycles, whether it's a Suzuki or a, Kau uh, well, maybe not Kawasaki, but some Kawasaki's and some other bikes, Hondas and so forth. Sometimes there's a little bit of an, ah, you know, I mean, okay, that's not such a good angle or likeness of the bike and stuff. And even my own Triumph, I mean, there are certain angles uh, where the bike looks good. And there are some where it looks like, ah, that wouldn't be such a good photograph uh, or a little bit less than flattering for the bike. <clears throat> With this bike, that is totally not the case. Uh, I defy anybody to take a bad photograph of, of this bike, uh, irrespective of where the camera sits on the bike, whether it's the back, over the top, or going up from the bottom, looking up to from the left side to the right side. It just it does not take a bad photograph. So, um, you know, so having said all of that, uh, and I believe it was voted the best looking super sport bike in the world. Um, you had to think when the bike first came out, which was either in 2010 or 11 or something to that effect, it was the, um, the F3 675 Oro, O R O, um, which was the first iteration of the bike. And that had sort of a, a darker Ruby red top, um, with gold wheels and so forth, a little bit different color configuration, but that was kind of the signature release or the, um, debut release of the f3 uh bike so the oro if you happen to find one is also a very in the back plate um which is this little area here was in gold um as well which is kind of cool uh so that that bike um the 670 basically essentially the 675 and the and the 800 are almost virtually the same bike there are some subtle uh, mechanical differences uh, between the two bikes. Um, and I'll just pause here for a minute because uh, I have my window open. So you're probably going to hear some external noise in the background during this live cast. Um, hopefully we'll get through it without uh, too much interference. But so um, uh, the, the, the subtle mechanical differences between the two bikes um, I believe some of the engine castings are slightly different on the 800 than on the 675. Um, now the only the, here's the thing: the 800 is the 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 engine, the block, and everything is virtually it's the, it's the same motor. Uh, the bore um, of the motor is and of the 800 and the 675 are the same. So basically, when you buy an 800. Oh, you're really getting a stroked 675. In other words, it has shorter con rods, which means that the um, the uh, the space between where the top of the piston reaches up near the cylinder head, near the um, exhaust ports, and when it goes down to its full cycle, is slightly longer. But having said that, it's still, even though it's a longer stroke than the 675, it's still a short stroke. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination because the damn thing just revs so doggone quick. Uh, and if you're not on your game or paying attention, uh, it could get away from you. So I would say that the other aspect of this is this is definitely not a bike for a novice or a beginner bike. This bike will, um, this bike would make, will make you rue the day that you, uh, uh, lacked any respect for it because this is certainly a bike that does command respect. It's, 
it's just it's probably the most unusual bike I've ever ridden and one of the only ways I can describe it uh, in terms of the way it behaves um, which is a broad overgeneralization is it behaves a little bit like a two-stroke it's really strange um, and I think that that is a symptom of the fact that they have not sorted out this ride-by-wire system now those of you who have been following my channel will uh, know that uh, I think it was over a year ago I had sort of spoke extensively about not really liking um, too many electronic jiggly hoos uh, on a motorcycle and certainly this bike does have a lot of those uh, electronic uh, aids rider aids and so forth on the bike and it also has ride by wire which um, I've not been too much of a fan, but I've understand that like Aprilia has done a, an extraordinary job um, with theirs, and I think Yamaha also has a, a ride by wire set up as well. And I believe that they've um, done a fairly decent job with their ride by wire system as well. Um, so again, the bike is not without its flaws, um, but it's even with its flaws, it's really hard to criticize this this motorcycle. Um, the the F three eight hundred in this spec here, uh, the way it's set up, um, you could get away with it being a road bike if you're really that much of a diehard. Uh, I think you would not have a problem, and that much of an enthusiast, you'd not have a problem riding this bike every day. And one of the reasons I say that is because of the ergonomics. Now, I was expecting when I got on the bike that it was going to be uncomfortable and just brutal, brutally uncomfortable. Uh, the one bike that comes to mind that is kind of brutal, at least for me anyway, I'm not speaking for all riders out there, but one of the bikes that um, for me that uh, that was really rather uncomfortable is the Yamaha R6, the current Yamaha R6. That is a buckboard bike. Um, and, but for some people it's fine. It's great. They don't have a problem with it. They like that. Um, they, you know, the ergos kind of fits them and their riding style and that's perfectly okay. Um, if, if you like that, that's okay, but it's not for me. I tend to like to be in a bike, not on it. And when you sit on an R6, you're definitely on top of the bike and not so much in it. Now, this is kind of true of the uh, Kawasaki ZX-10R. Uh, um, this is true of the uh, Triumph Daytona 675. It's certainly true of the Triumph, Triumph Street Triple uh, and maybe even the Speed Triple. Uh, and probably a few other bikes as well. The Honda CBR is kind of weird. Um, uh, the the 600. It's kind of a sort of a compromise between an R6 and a um, a GSXR, which also has a very sculpted or scalloped out seat area where you really, you know, the 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 bike kind of cradles you inside, and you know you can wrap your legs around the tank and all that sort of thing. Uh, so the the GSXRs definitely have that sort of in the bike feel you're like sitting in the bike as opposed to on top of it uh and i think the cbr falls somewhere between if i remember uh the bikes correctly between the three the r6 the cbr 600 and the um uh and the jixer uh the cbr is kind of a compromise between the r6 and the jixer in terms of where you sit in the bike so i was kind of expecting when i sat on this bike that it was going to be uh, grossly uncomfortable um, and just, you know, I, I was just going to want to get off it and which that was totally not the case at all. I was really uh, just on the cusp of being shocked that it was as comfortable as it was. It's still very much a uh, race profile when you sit on the bike, but for a bike that has a very much of a race profile, it's, surprisingly comfortable and i would actually put it i'd almost put it on par with my street triple which is really kind of weird um and the reason why i say that is because uh the f3 has a very narrow frame profile which means that uh, it's it's very thin um in terms of like wrapping your legs around it so for example if you're a tend to be on a little bit on the shorter side you're probably going to be okay 
on this bike. If you are used to a Daytona 675, you're definitely going to be fine and, and, and love this bike. Um, uh, and although again, I mean, for myself, I wouldn't, it's not a bike I would want to ride all day long. Um, but then again, I, that's probably a misnomer because I didn't, <laughs> quite frankly, I didn't even want to get off the bike when I started riding it. I just, I didn't want to, I just wanted to explore it more because um, there's so much to learn about the way the bike behaves. And I wished I'd gotten to ride it on some slower uh, roads. If you've watched my first video, um, sort of review ish type of video, um, it was on a kind of on a state road highway type of thing, um, which gave me a chance to really open the bike up and feel uh, and explore the power of the bike. Uh, which is really what you want to do if you're getting on a bike like this. You don't want to go somewhere where it's like 25 or 30 mile an hour roads and not being be able to see what the bike is capable of. Now, is this a bike? Uh, is this the, is this a road bike that you could ride every day? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose if you're a diehard sport bike kind of person, um, you could probably find a way to live on it. Um, personally, I do not, I am not of the consensus. How well, I guess it depends on where you live too. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that this would be the ideal, um, type of road, uh, slash sport bike. In my opinion, this is a bike, a, a second bike that I would have, um, to just, you know, get silly on once in a while. Uh, or, or track. This this is a very track focused bike. I can't even stress that enough. Very, very, very track focused. It's the kind of bike where the faster you ride it, the better it gets. It just it it cannot. Um, uh, speaking of riding fast, there goes the siren. But anyway, um, something n none of us ever like to hear. So it's it's it, the way to describe it. It's kind of like an. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the description of the SR-71 Blackbird, which is a which was a military spy plane, which I think has since been decommissioned. But um, the SR-71 would like leak fuel all over the place, and then the faster it would go, um, it would uh, the seams in the plane would expand, and, and everything would just tighten up, and you know it would it would perform the way it was supposed or intended to perform, and I would say that that's kind of uh, a close analogy to how I would describe the way this bike behaves. The faster you ride it, the better it gets. And I got to tell you, because there aren't, uh, I believe this is the only, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's currently, I, I got to go back and look at this, but I, and I should have looked at it before I started this live cast, but um bike that has a counter rotating crankshaft in other words the motor or the crank in the motor actually spins backwards while the wheels you know turning clockwise the crankshaft turns counterclockwise and the engineering philosophy behind that is that it uh if those of you familiar who are riding sport bikes and hard cornering and that sort of thing or just even riding any bike you notice that the bike wants to stand up and so you have to really dig and push it into the turn, you know, with your counter steering and all that. And you really got to get the bike to tip over. It's total. It's like almost not the case with this bike. It just, the turn in is, is quite effort. Well, at least compared to my bike, um, it was almost effortless. I was really shocked. I was really, one of the other things that really surprised me about this bike is, is the turn in was just, you could turn it in and just accelerate and accelerate and accelerate and it would just want to do more and more and more. And, um, so that was the other, uh, element of this bike. So that's a, that's Moto GP tech right there. I mean, the counter rotating crankshaft is, um, formula one Moto GP, uh, technology that has found its way into this bike. Um, the way this bike revs, uh, you get like nothing, I mean, it's pretty, pretty. I would say ordinary in the lower RPMs. Uh, nothing unpredictable there. But once you get into a certain rev range, I mean, it just it becomes manic. Um, it just become it becomes a maniac of a bike. It just uh, it really at at first it almost, um, <laughs> you know, my jaw dropped. I was like, holy crap. 
uh, and that's sort of what I wrote on my, um, uh, I put there in, in my video because that's literally how it made you feel. Um, it's been said that this bike is kind of the Italian answer to the GSXR 750. Uh, this is what you would call a super middleweight uh, bike. Um, if I were to get this, I, you would almost not really even, I mean, the way this bike behaves, I mean, it just, and when you get it in that rev range, it just, um, it just pulls and pulls and pulls and it doesn't stop until it, you know, hits the brick wall at its red line. It just keeps pulling all the way up to the red line. Um, it, it's just phenomenal that way. Um, the chassis on this bike, the brakes on this bike are, and the motor, in my opinion, are light years uh, ahead of the Gixxer, which means that, um, which is to say that if you're looking for a super middleweight bike, there's going to be two different schools of thought here. Uh, most people are probably going to opt for the Suzuki only because one, it's Japanese, uh, and two, uh, they've been around forever. Um, one of the smart things that Suzuki did was they never eliminated their 750, uh, and to their credit, um, they've, uh, done very well with that bike. They say, I don't know, the saying is, is it's the best, uh, 600, um, ever made. Uh, so essentially, I, th I believe that the, the GSX-R750 shares um, much of its DNA. The 600 and the 750 are almost virtually the same bike. I don't know if they've uh, it's a, if it's a bigger bore, the same block bigger bore, um, or a different stroke. I've not do done too much research on that bike, but I would most certainly like to and, and revisit it later. Um, so... Uh, it just the, the 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 way this bike handles uh it, it's so in it's so intuitive you very much feel a part of the bike um and you really feel like you're riding something special it's it's hard to uh there's been some complaints of a notchy gearbox if you will and i would say my other complaint about the bike would be that it is um how could i say or how could i put it um it's kind of like, uh, gosh, um, oh man, I don't know. It's, it's like a, uh, um, I just lost my train of thought here. Um, it's, uh, well, okay. Let me go, let me just go back to the, the, the GSXR and the sort of mild comparison between the two bikes because, they're in sort of the same CC class. And the interesting thing about it is, is 10, 15 years ago, uh, or maybe even a little bit longer, I'm not sure, the 750s used to be the super bikes. That, that was like, if you had a 750, you were, and then they started getting into the uh, 900 CCs and that sort of thing. And then eventually the leader bike class evolved um, out of that or out of the super mid, uh, what is now considered uh, the super mid, um, uh, the super middleweight sports bikes, uh, 148 horsepower on the crank, approximately 130 horsepower at the rear wheel, which is more than enough for the, I mean, why you need any more than that for the street is just silly. Um, of course, if you live out in Montana or out in the Midwest or out in any of those huge States, then you're going to be like, you know, that's a toy bike. And it is a small bike, by the way. This is a, it, it is a, it's got a very small profile, a narrow profile. So it is a very small bike. Um, and I think it's approximately between 410 and 420 pounds wet. Uh, but I could stand to be corrected on that as well. Um, I can't remember because I don't have the specs in front of me, but I seem to recall that some were saying that this was a little bit heavier than they expected. I think the claimed dry weight was something like 382 pounds dry. Um, Nick Rockwell of Rockwell Cycles has actually found a way to dump 40 pounds, somewhere around 40 pounds off of the bike, uh, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. You'd think you wouldn't be able to find 40 pounds, but he did. Um, he actually redesigned the uh, subframe or the, or I don't know if he redesigned it, but he found a tailpiece 
that is much lighter than the steel. Um, I think the steel piece on the back of the motor uh, is weighs like 20 pounds or something to that effect. So uh, he was actually able to find a way to uh, eliminate some of the weight there. I understand that the the catalytic converter, which is built into part of the exhaust system, carries quite a bit of weight. So you could probably get away with another losing another 15 pounds there if you swapped out uh, the exhaust. And certainly if you went with carbon fiber wheels, um, you're going to save a ton more weight there. Uh, so you could pr conceivably get this bike down to the low. I'm guesstimating, but I'm conceivably get this bike down to the low 300s. And if you have 130 horsepower on your rear tire with a, uh, you know, a bike that's slightly more than 300 pounds, I mean, you're doing fine on a race. You're going to be fine um, on a racetrack. In fact, you're getting very close to, um, uh, well, actually, uh, not World Super Sport or uh, World Superbike, but you're actually getting closer to uh, MotoGP type of weights um, with respect to, uh, the bike, the weight of the bike, and that sort of in performance, uh, weight to per performance or power to weight ratio performance is going to be closer to, I would say, a GP bike um, than a World Super Sport uh, bike. Because I think in Super Sport, they still, they have to use the, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think they still have to use the stock rims or wheels uh, sort of thing. Whereas in GP, I think they're able to use carbon fiber um, because those bikes are obviously they're not spec for the street at all. They're just uh, entirely meant for the track. Uh, so anyway, um, so let's go to some of the cons of the bike and, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, as I stated earlier, the bike kind of behaves and I don't know if they, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm kind of scratching my head. I'm like, did they intend for this bike to behave a little bit like a two stroke? Because, they were trying to bring back some of the elements or was it just an engineering um, faux pas, if you will, with respect to getting the connection between. And what I mean by that, I guess, let me, let me see if I can describe this. Uh, those of us who are familiar with riding, um, you know, sport bikes, you blip the throttle and you downshift and the revs are bang, bang, bang. You like down, bang down through the gears and the revs are right there all the time. Like boom, 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 boom. It's not like that on this bike. Uh, when you, at least it wasn't for, for me when I um, attempted to sort of rev match my downshifts, there was a delay. And when you have a delay like that and you're attempting to ro if you're going to race, you, you can't have that problem and you particularly can't have that problem if i would say if you're on the road uh if you're trying to use engine braking to slow the bike down now for a lot of people um that's going to be a deal breaker for this bike uh, and i would submit to you that it doesn't have to be because i've under uh, based on some of the threads that i've read or some of the information that i've read you can actually customize which kind of is a little bit more work than some people want to do or get involved with in today's world of turnkey bikes. Most people just want to turn the key, jump on the bike and ride it. Uh, and if you're that kind of person, this is not the kind of bike for you. Um, and I say that and, and as much as I love this bike. And if I were to be a salesperson, I would be honest with them. I said, listen, if you're looking for a turnkey bike where you can just jump on it and go, um, and so forth, and you're thinking you're more of a pragmatic type of person, this is not the kind of bike for you. And this is a this kind of bike is the bike for a person who is a hardcore uh, motorcycle enthusiast. That's the type of bike um, or the, the, the type of audience that this bike is tailored to. If you're really into road racing, um, if you're into handling, and if you're also into the sort of the cachet surrounding the whole uh, MV Augusta um, legacy uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, you're going to get all of that with this bike uh, because that bike is every bit of that and, and is encapsulates all of that uh, and more, in my opinion. Um, so I would say that uh, the problem with the downshift or the rev, being able to rev match, uh, particularly on just the maps that have, 
pre-programmed into the bike make it uh, just, I would say, maybe somewhat frustrating at the very least and perhaps maybe annoying at the very worst. Um, now, my friend in the UK uh, who owns this bike or who owned, he owned this bike for quite some, an, enough time where apparently they had it in the shop and they were trying to mastermind a way to work around. And I would submit to MV Agusta. I mean, you, this is the closest thing to riding sport bike perfection that you're ever going, in my opinion, I still need to ride the Ducati 899, but based on a lot of the information that I've said, I've, I've read, um, everything that the reviewers say about this bike, uh, it is pretty much spot on in, in a lot of respects. So there, well, and I say that, um, with some reservation because some reviewers are more biased than others. And I would have to say, uh, there are a few reviewers in the motor, in the moto world that actually are able to kind of step back and take their em sort of an, um, uh, a less emotional approach to the bike and say, you know what, um, this is what's wrong with the bike. It's, it's still a great bike, but if they could just get this, these few things sorted out, it would just be riding perfection. And this bike w would be that, uh, if it were not for that mechanic, I think it's a mechanical problem. If I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know if it has to do with the, the actual, uh, firmware, uh, where the, the ECU controller is talking to the flaps, uh, where the flaps are not opening. Um, there's too much of a delayed reaction with the, with the butterflies opening and closing. I don't know. Um, and the only people that would probably really know anything about that are obviously MV Agusta and maybe some engineers at Mercedes Benz. I don't know how involved Mercedes Benz has been involved with, uh, with this sorts of things, but you know, this is the kind of thing where if you add too much tech to the bike, you run into a problem where you have it, the, the, you know, the, the attraction to the bike is that it has the tech. The problem is, is that when you have tech in a bike, you also run the risk of having more problems to sort through. And so a company has to decide, uh, is having this amount of tech in the bike worth the headaches that are going to come back to bite us in the ass? Um, when a customer complains about, you know, in this case, the electronics or the ride by wire system in, in the bike. Okay. So now having said all of that, um, some of you who have been following world super sport, uh, racing um also know that mv agusta has been winning lots of races and in fact i think Ju um jules clusel uh number 16 on the mv agusta 670 f3 675 is within 10 points of Kenan safoglu who is racing on the kawasaki uh zx uh six um uh motorcycle and uh I'm guessing that because if they had that problem with this bike, there's no way they could race this bike on the track, uh, given that problem. So I'm thinking that they probably have some other, a completely different electronics package, uh, and setup for the track, uh, for world super sport bike on this bike. And if I had to guess, I'd actually like to do some research, but somebody may know more than I do on this. Um, I would be willing to submit that they probably have, um, uh, uh, Magneti Morelli. They're probably using a Magneti Morelli electronics uh, configuration where there's, you know, where, you know, if he blips the throttle and he's downshifting, there's, it just works the way it's supposed to work. If they could get, if, uh, I mean, you know, I think we need to sign a petition or something and just um, like bang on MV Agusta's door and say, look, the bike is perfect the way it is, except you got to get rid of. I mean, get rid of the electronics that are there and start from scratch or find an electronic package that, that works and complements the bike and doesn't work against um, the bike or the rider. You know, I guarantee you, man, if they do that, guys will be dumping, dropping, they'll just be like rolling their Jixers into the dealership tomorrow and saying, that's the bike I want and I don't care that it costs three grand more. 
I want that bike. Um, that's me right now, even knowing, knowing full well there's that problem with the bike. That's me. Um, I'm, I'm that kind of guy who would say I would rather have this bike than the GSXR because, uh, in my opinion, the Gixxer is just what we would call a me too bike. Um, good bike, not knocking the bike. It's just all, a lot of guys ride them. A lot of guys have them, but there's a reason for that too. They're, uh, they're easy to get parts for probably, um, generally easy to work on. And, uh, they race them on the track for that reason because they're easy to get parts for and so and so maintaining a bike like that is just cakewalk and it's a no-brainer and especially if you don't have a whole lot of money to throw around on motorcycles um because motorcycles can be a money pit uh, anything from doing track days to maintaining and adding um uh you know adding putting all the bells and whistles on your bike or putting stuff on your bike that you want to have uh, anything from like having, you know, Rizoma stuff or, um, you know, a decent set of tires and all that sort of thing. So some guys will just, I mean, I've seen some guys ride there, but like, you know, there's threads on the tires. They've not done oil changes in like eight or 10,000 miles. Um, they don't even add oil to the bike for gosh sakes. Um, they just like run them right into the ground. Uh, you know, it just depends on who you are. Uh, and, and what kind of riding you like to do. And, um, but this is the type of bike that is definitely tailored to someone who is a motorcycle enthusiast, uh, loves road racing and, um, obviously appreciates something extremely beautiful. Um, the other, one of the other things aside from the electronics that I wanted to talk about was, uh, what is it? The, um, yes. It needs a steering damper. This bike could very much use a steering damper. And I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, MV has, MV has listened to some people. And I think that some of their bikes are now, or more of their bikes, uh, come with steering dampers on them. So that's cool. And, uh, that's actually a, a, a huge, yeah, the bike definitely, um, when you go over a bump, or you get come out of a turn the wrong way on this bike. I mean, that's one of the things that will bite you in the rear end is that head shake. Um, I experienced that firsthand and I was going in a straight line actually. And I hit a nasty bump um, in a road and it was in the middle of accelerating and shifting, no less. Uh, the bike did shake it off and I was happy that it did. Um, but you got to have a steering damper on this bike. There are no two ways around that. Um, and I think, you know, companies will cut corners and I don't think MV is an exception to a company attempting to, or trying to cut corners, uh, in the effort to get the product out. Um, I think they could have done, but the sacks, uh, some people have different opinions about the, the rear shock, the sacks rear shock, um, and the Marzacci uh, forks, which are up front, the brakes are phenomenal on this bike. Uh, so no complaints there about the brakes. The handling is just, the handling is just otherworldly. You're not going to, you're not going to get on another bike and find, um, I did, I would say that there were some similar handling characteristics between this bike and my street triple. Um, but, uh, I would say it was subtle. Um, that's the only way I could put it. The subtle handling characteristics, predictable, um, confidence inspiring, all that good stuff. But, um, uh, you know, I guess, and also having the, 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 the frame profile being narrow and all that kind of stuff, um, was also one of the similar characteristics between that bike and my bike, both three cylinder bikes, um, et cetera, and so on. So, <clears throat> uh, I guess the other thing is, is that, okay, I covered steering damper. Um, maybe the gearbox, I mean, gearbox is fine. Maybe a tad bit notchy, but I don't, I wonder, gearboxes tend to be, I think at the, uh, some bikes, not all of them, but a lot of bikes, I think tend to be kind of a little bit notchy in the beginning um, when they're brand new. And as they get sort of, if they get uh, uh, worn in properly, then there's no problem. Uh, with with that, 
Um, I almost would have liked to have a dry clutch option on this bike, which would also be a weight saving factor. I don't know if that's something MV is actually contemplating um, in, in the near future uh, for this bike, but it would certainly be very cool if it did have a dry clutch. So uh, that's the other thing with this. Um, anybody who's worth their salt has to ride this bike. I just, you know, I can't stress that enough. Uh, even if you never ride, um, even if you never buy the bike, you have to find a way to just ride it. Uh, that's the only thing I can say. I mean, it just really does make you feel special. And the faster you ride it, the better it gets. It just, I, I don't even know how to, I mean, it's like, I've, it's not like nothing I've ever ridden before. Um, I know that I'm just kind of running on and on and on about this, but, uh, it was that, um, it was that kind of experience where you just say, yeah, you know, and I wish I could have had more time, um, with the bike and taken it on some different roads and so forth. Um, but you know, a stroked 675 that could prob I'm, I'm most certainly keep pace with some leader bikes, uh, depending on the road, of course is is a phenomenal to me a, just a phenomenal um testament to and en the engineering of this bike um the corner speed that this bike can carry uh everything about it it's just it's amazing to me and uh, it's one of those things that just leaves your jaw you know dragging on the floor i mean you look at everything that you imagine about the bike when you look at it is mostly true when you ride it that, that's probably a good way to put it. That's probably the only way I can describe it at this point. Um, okay, so that's sort of my overview of the F3. I have more content um, that I want to upload about uh, the bike that, I'll, um, that I sort of get into. I was actually able to talk to Nick Rockwell, who uh, owns a motorcycle dealership. He's also raced uh, bikes extensively. He builds race bikes and so on. So I was able to have kind of a lengthy conversation with him. Um, also hoping to get to kind of do a uh, sort of a short interview um, with him about, you know, his whole, because he's a really interesting guy to talk to um, as well. And then uh, some other updates. Um, I'm actually work in the process of developing or working on designing. And this kind of goes out to people who are using Sony um, action cams. Uh, as you know, some of you know, I started using a Sony action cam. I got to say, and <laughs> I can't, ha I can't hold this back. I mean, the, the, it's a phenomenal camera. It's just that there, there's little to no um, mounting solutions uh, proper mounting solutions for the camera. The the mounting solutions are very thin on that camera. And I've had to frustratingly um, develop my own sort of makeshift mounting solutions for the camera, uh, which is not a, I mean, it's sort of a big deal, but it's not a big deal. Um, I like the ability to be able to just plug in a microphone without having to get an adapter for the, like, and the GoPro, you need to have a one eighth inch adapter uh, to, into like the USB, uh, which goes between the camera and the actual male end of the uh, microphone, um, uh, where the microphone plugs in. And the Sony is, has brilliant because they just provided you with a proper input. I don't understand why GoPro couldn't have, uh, built that into their camera. They could conceivably have just put a regular, um, what is it, a two and a half millimeter or three and a half millimeter, or one eighth inch um, input for your microphone as opposed to having to buy an adapter. But that's neither here nor there. Um, then there's the the uh, getting the the SD card in and out of the Sony is a little bit uh, annoying, if I'm honest. Um, but although I do like the, I actually prefer the interface of setting up the camera on the Sony over the GoPro. Uh, both menus are kind of cryptic, but it just depends on how you like to scroll through menus and stuff. And I think the, in my opinion, the Sony is plenty intuitive. Some people have complained about it not be as, being as intuitive as the GoPro. Um, 
I would say that's not the case. It's just a different interface. It's not more difficult. It's just different. That's all. Uh, some say that the GoPro has better quality than the Sony. I uh, have different opinions about that. Um, the fisheye lens on the Sony versus the GoPro, I would say the GoPro probably gives you a tad bit more of the, the lens, the optic, sort of the, uh, what, I, what I mean by this is when you look at a lot of these point of view cameras uh, and film and stuff, what you see is this sort of warped or bending um, around the edges. And I think that at least in my camera, that certainly seems to be the case. It's a little bit more pronounced um, on my camera than, let's say, on a GoPro. Um, I'm not too terribly bothered by that. But, you know, again, that comes down to preference. Um, I like, as I said, I think in the video I did a few weeks ago, uh, I like both cameras. There are different, there are things about both cameras that I like, um, A or dislike uh, sort of thing. So um, there's that. Um, I've had some requests to do a test ride on an 890, a Ducati 899 Panigale, which will be forthcoming. Oh, also, I did get to test ride the Zero Electric bike. And I just want a brief comment about that. That bike is a hoot. It's a twist and go. Uh, and a lot of people don't like the idea that it's a twist and go. But um, it's a fun bike, no less, and um, it just does very well. Um, I would say that that bike is perfectly tailored for like city drive, city riding uh, sort of thing. Or if you're on a camping trip or something, uh, you might want, uh, you'd still have to charge them. And I think the range, like if you have it uh, pinned all the way or all the time is like 70 or 80 or 85 miles or something like that. I could be wrong, but I understand zero is actually developing. Uh, I've heard a rumor that zero is developing new battery technology that's supposed to like triple the range, the current range uh, of that bike. But um, that zero electric motorcycle was extremely impressive uh, to ride. It, it was a, a lot different than I thought it might be actually. And for what it is, it's, it's a good bike. Um, you, you'll probably never be able to kill the dog on thing because it's electric and you're talking about a lot, uh, you know, a lot less maintenance. And that's one of the, one of the reasons why electric bikes, uh, one of the reasons why electric bikes tend to be more expensive than petrol bikes or gasoline, uh, bikes is because they require, uh, less, uh, maintenance. Um, you only probably have to, I don't know how often you'd probably have to change the brushes on the electric motor, uh, magnets or whatever. Um, and then of course there, you know, how long does the battery last? I mean, how, what, what is the cost of replacing the batteries once they've reached their shelf life, uh, of however many charges that they can get before they start to deteriorate, deteriorate and fail to hold a charge. So there's that cost consideration, but um, I'm certain that there are probably uh, oil company lobbyists that are trying to stonewall uh, battery tech development and that sort of thing, because they just don't want people, you know, making the jump or making the shift. And I think that there's going to be a demand for both, even if battery technology was great, I'd still think that there would be a demand for petroleum bikes, but then it costs, of course, uh, it would occur to me that I guess uh, if there's less of a, de a, a demand for uh, gasoline, they would it would drive the cost of fuel down. And certainly that's sort of kind of somewhat been the case uh, because people are changing their um, commuting habits, their driving habits and so on. Uh, which is required, you know, people are finding ways to save money. And one of them is to drive less uh, to save uh, money on fuel. And that's one of the things that's driven the cost of fuel down. But anyway, I'm sort of digressing. But um, the electric bike is a great thing. That's uh, a twist and go. I think uh, there's, I, can't, I think it's the Bramo that has the uh, six, five or the six gears that, where you can shift it like a regular motorcycle. Some felt that it didn't need any more than two speeds because it was electric, but I guess that they were trying to appeal to the the traditionalist crowd and keeping the bike like a six speed and that sort of stuff. So 
um, but so you have some electric bikes that have the shifting and then I think most of them are just twist and goes uh, sort of thing. But the technology in the last few years has come a long way for electric bikes, which is uh, great, which is a great thing. Um, anyway, uh, I just like to, and the other thing before I, I sign off here, I'd like to thank the, uh, my subscribers, um, you, the subscribers have given me the incentive to, uh, keep going and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination as popular as a lot of these other, uh, moto channels. Um, and I don't subscribe to a lot of other moto vloggers, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, I've watched quite a lot of other moto vloggers. Um, I just don't. Um, uh, I guess the stuff they do is not entirely my cup of tea, uh, but to each his own. Um, I just uh, I, I have so many different ideas, and I don't like to. I've not liked to stick to one particular format. So anyway. Having said all that, I wanted to do. I wanted to thank um, the subscribers who have faithfully uh, stayed with my channel, and I'd also like to thank the subscribers who, if you're a new subscriber to the channel, um, I would also like to thank you as well. And um, I also just like to thank those moto vloggers who actually have, in fact, given me shoutouts. Um, I can only think of maybe um, two or three. Uh, I know that Torqued off, Torqued off is actually, um, he's another moto vlogger. I, he's a great guy, actually. I've um, sort of had a little bit of a conversation with him, sort of back and forth in the threads and stuff. And just a really nice, really down-to-earth guy who has some great ideas about uh, filming and so forth. Um, I also like to think, I, I don't, I think I've been remiss. But there's an old uh, a vlogger, I think he's either first or second gen, but he goes way back um, quite a few more years than, than myself. Um, but he subscribed to my channel, uh, and I think he still subscribes to my channel, is uh, toast to go um, And he did this really phenomenal. He took my logo, and he uh, uh, made a decal for me, which I put on the back of my helmet. So... Um, I wanted to thank him for that. I mean, he didn't have to do that, but he did and and uh, didn't charge me anything for it. And we just sort of exchanged stickers and stuff like that. But I just thought it was a, a really nice gesture um, to, to have that done. So I want to thank him. And I uh, just want to thank everybody else who has uh, stuck with me thus far. Um, so there's more stuff coming. Um, I have a lot of other things that are just going on right now that have, uh, in, in my, in my family and my personal life, um, that, that, uh, just require, that's my priority. I mean, my family and my personal life is my priority. And then doing YouTube and uploading content and stuff has been a secondary priority. It's mostly, it's kind of been a hobby more than anything. It would be nice to turn it into a career. Uh, and I've certainly had thoughts about that as well. But uh, I just, again, want to thank all of you who have been patient and stuck with me thus far. And if you're enjoying the content, uh, giving me the thumbs up, uh, sharing my videos, liking the videos, and all that good stuff. You can follow me on Instagram, Zone Television at Instagram. I do have a website that's being developed right now, I'm working on development. Um, and I also have some products that uh, are being are kind of in the developmental stage. Um, and one of which is, I sort of addressed it earlier, but the Sony point of view cameras, um, a friend of mine and I are working on some uh, mounting solutions, uh, that some better mounting solutions um, for the masses who, uh, for the people who like to use the Sony point of view cameras, because there's really, the, the field is really thin when it comes to uh, mounting solutions. And quite a few moto vloggers have come up with some very clever solutions. Uh, Everride, uh, I think he's out in the West somewhere, came up with a really kind of cool but <laughs> sort of precarious situation where he uh, had the um, the dual lock Velcro uh, and a piece of steel which he which he formed on the side of his helmet, and that was a really cool mounting solution. I thought I actually watched that video. So Everride, um, 
came up with a very cool solution for that, uh, uh, for the Sony uh, point of view ca action cameras and so forth. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching and thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And we will see you out on the road.